uh, somewhat of a restful afternoon. This is the day of rest, but uh, a lot of folks don't rest on this day. They do it just as much on Sunday now as they do during the week, and it's no wonder folks uh, uh, are, are tired and weary all the time, but I'm glad you're here. We're going to sing number 495 this evening. Brethren, we have met to worship. I pray this morning that, or this afternoon that we'll come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you once again for your goodness to us another day. Thankful, dear God, for uh, just being able to be here. I'm mindful that our folks, Lord, not here tonight would give anything to be able just to go to church one more time. And yet, Lord, my heart hurts because there are people who could be in church, Lord, and just won't come. Lord, we pray for both and that you'll minister to them as only you can. Bless now this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all stand and sing. 495.
Well, I always think of who was it? Caleb in the Bible. And God had promised him a certain mountain. And so after 40 years in the wilderness and they were divided up and he spoke to Joshua. He said, you remember now what was promised me? And he, he took off toward that mountain that belonged to him. I think that's the way it ought to be in our life. You know, there's some mountains that we need to learn to conquer in our lives. But anyway, let's go ahead and get this announcement out of the way. Uh, don't forget we have church again Wednesday at, uh, at, at 7 o'clock. And this Wednesday and, and then next Sunday, I hope to have things out for you. We want you to adopt a missionary or two. And we're going to put, their, put them out, and mainly our foreign missionaries. We may put a few of our home missionaries out too. And I would hope you really look forward to doing this. We're going to give you the name and as much as we can about them, how you can contact them, communicate with them on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, it's amazing today with the technology we have, you can, you can talk to a missionary halfway around the world just like you talk, talk to them across town sometimes. And so uh, anyway, it'll be a good way for you to uh, get more involved in missions and they can share things with you personally just by back and forth communication and you'll enjoy that. And so I hope you'll be involved in, and look forward to doing this. It'd be, it would be a great thing for every couple to do it. And of course, a family with children, children getting involved with it because many of our, most of our missionaries have children with them on the field. So we're going to be doing that hopefully by Wednesday, get it ready and have you sign up and then I'll push it again next Sunday morning also, okay? And, uh, but that's about all the announcements I have to make. I am going to go ahead and unless, unless the Lord changes my heart, we're going to start Sunday school back up in sep the first Sunday in September, Lord willing. And, uh, I know this, uh, this, uh, virus is more and more people getting tested for it. And there's a reason for that. Folks are tired of staying home <laughs> and they're getting out and they're going. And, uh, uh, I mean, many, many people have tested positive. They didn't even know they had it. And so we were just sort of chatting before, before church. And now uh, this is nothing you laugh at. And it's not funny because some folks die from this. And here's my point. When someone dies, it's always, it's always a sad time, whether they die from pneumonia, the flu, or this virus, or whatever it may be. And uh, so a lot of folks are being tested positive for it and don't even know that the symptoms. And those symptoms are there. And, uh, but anyway, it's almost like, let me test positive and get it, get it, get it behind me and go on. And uh, if it would be that easy. But anyway, I hope and pray that you'll not let it uh, affect you as far as your walk with God and your faith in God. And uh, be as safe as you can. But don't let the devil, don't let the devil get you to hibernate just because you're scared to death. Amen. There's a life to live and live it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now I will say this: folks who have respiratory problems need to be careful. Amen. And uh, that's, that's bad, and especially uh, those up in years who have that problem. But anyway, all right, but I think that's all the announcements I have right now. Let's have another good song, Brother Brian. Amen. Amen. All right, you can remain seated on this one. Turn to page 348, 348. All three stanzas, where could I go but to the Lord? Amen. 348.
can go to the Lord in prayer, no matter what the situation is. Well, tonight's other's offering uh, is for Brother uh, Jack Shook and his wife, and and uh, he's a dear friend of ours, and she is too, and and uh, he is doing much better. He's not doing much better. He got put back in the hospital. Okay, so went from not good to good. Now he's back in the hospital. Got sent back today. Well, well, we're going to still send a love offering. And we're going to pray for him. Amen. I love Brother and Sister Shook. They're just, just, uh, just personal friends and great man of God, great lady of the Lord. And uh, so we want to be a big help to him tonight. And we'll try to get that offering in the mail tomorrow. They'll get it sometime this week. And uh, so we just have to keep praying for him to get better, get back home, and, and uh, get back to doing God's will for his life. How old is your grandpa now? 83. Great day alive. Man. And uh, up until he had this back problem, he was still going strong. And that back surgery messed him up. Then, of course, got this virus. And so let's pray for Brother Shook and Miss Shook and the Lord to help them. So that's where it's going to go. Let's get a good offering tonight and, uh, and uh, pray the Lord to bless them, okay? And we're going to see. Before we do this, in a few moments before I preach, I want each of you here. I'm preaching tonight, once again, out of the book of Philippians. And we're going to uh, preach on the joy of salvation, past, present, and future, okay? And we'll address that in chapter, th beginning in chapter 3 tonight. We're going to deal with uh, salvation, uh, the joy of salvation, taking care of our past, amen? So I'm going to ask each of you, when, we get ready, when I get ready to preach, uh, can you tell us, uh, if you can, uh, when you got saved, maybe what age you were, or about uh, you know, some folks may not remember every detail, but if you can, we'd like to hear about it, okay? And so, uh, why? It's important that you know you're saved. That's the most important thing in the world. And uh, somebody said one time, you know, preacher, some folks, as they get older, they lose their memory, and they forget things. Well, we may forget, but God doesn't forget, amen? Thank God. So let's sing a good song, a couple of verses of a good song, and receive tonight's other song. I'll stand once again, page 389, 389, we'll sing the first and last, I will sing the wondrous story. Jared, since it's your grandpa, I'm going to ask you to pray for him and pray for the offering, that the Lord will bless him and bless this offering. Would you pray?
Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going, we're going to have another special before I preach, and we'll get that in just a moment or two. But I'll, I'll get this thing started about being saved and, and looking back to when you got saved. And uh, if you don't remember all the details for some reason or another, I'll give you an example. I got saved when I was 19 in May of 1969. How about that? So I've been saved since then, okay? Uh, it, but Tommy, when was you saved? October 17th. October, October 1974. Amen. Ruth? May of 1976. Oh, you and Brenda, Cookville, Tennessee. You met her that weekend. Okay, amen. Uh, Judy? Wow. Sunday morning, as you remember, it was the Lord's Supper service. Isn't that good? Amen. Sunday morning. March 12, 2016. February 2012. March 2018. Amen. Miss Mary? August 1977. Oh, boy. Brad? Year 2000. Margaret? August of what? August of 1981. 1981. August. Yes, ma'am? March 3rd, 1998. March 1998. Justina? Day after Christmas. <laughs> All right. Over here, Sherry. October 77. May of 64. Fall of 1972. April 2014. December 2016. July what? 25th. You know what year it was? Twelve. Oh, I didn't hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. Savannah? 2002. Amen. Kathy? April 2015. Thursday Night Revival with Brother Tom Lancaster preaching up in Earhart, South Carolina. Okay, back here in the back. Any of you? August 98. <laughs> September 98. Okay, Brenda. November 19 what? 68. October 92. You were 12? You mean you can get saved in Texas? Uh-huh. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that good? Well, it's good you know you're saved. Amen. You may not remember all the stuff about it. It's good to be saved. And I wish other folks are here to hear that. And uh, But all right, we got one more song. And uh, actually, the last two songs we sang had going to do with the night's message. And then this, this song here is also going to uh, introduce, uh, be a part of our message for this evening. Let's go. Long years ago, long years ago, when out in sin, I had no home, I had no, home no peace within. No peace within. Down, on my knees, down on my knees, in agony, I prayed to Jesus, and He gladly set me free. 
I never shall, I never shall forget the day, forget forget the day when all the burdens from my soul were rolled away. It made me happy, it made me happy, glad and free. Glad and free. I'll sing and shout it for He's everything to me. Now I can feel, now I can feel Him by my side. Steps he comes to guide when trials come. When trials come, he comforts me. Through faith in him or sin, I have the victory. I never shall, I never shall forget the day. Forget the day when all the burdens from my soul were rolled away. Everything to me. Oh sinner, come, oh sinner, come to Jesus now. To Jesus now. At His dear feet, At His dear feet. Just humbly bow, just humbly bow. Confess to Him, confess to Him your every sin, your every sin. He'll save and cleanse you, give you peace and joy with Him. I never shall. All God folk would say, what? Amen. Amen. The reason I, I, I chose that song, because it really is uh, going to fit right in with our message for tonight as we continue our, our uh, um, uh, sermons and messages from the book of Philippians, the joyful church, the church at Philippi. And uh, tonight we're going to look into chapter number three and uh, the joy of salvation's past present, and future. And tonight's message is going to deal with the salvation dealing with our past, okay? Uh, we're going to be reading here uh, verses 1 through 11. Uh, Paul said in chapter 3 of Philippians, uh, in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concession, uh, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit <coughs> and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But, that, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yet doubtless, and I count all things but lost, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now we're going to go through these 11 verses tonight and look at the uh, uh, Paul mentioned here about his salvation. And uh, uh, this chapter has a word in it that stands out a good bit in the word, is the word things. Uh, 
uh, things, T-H-I-N-G-S, and you'll find that in many of these verses. And because of that, it brought to my mind this statement, people get all wrapped up in things. If you're not careful, the things of life and the things of the world and uh, the things uh, that's on your mind will occupy you all the time. And Paul lived for those things. But after he got saved, those things he counted but lost to him. Don't let the things of life consume you. And the things that you need, let the Lord deal with you about that. Let him take care of those things. Matter of fact, he tells us if, if our heart will be right toward him and if we love him like we should, he'll give us the desires of our hearts. Amen? And so people get wrapped up in things and things become what they live for and sometimes what they die for. Salvation has its phases. You know that. Uh, what do you mean, Brother Baker, it has its phases? Well, you have the first phase of salvation is the day you got saved. How about that? Most of you remembered uh, uh, the, the year and the month that you got saved or maybe the, the place where you were, maybe who was preaching and what the message was and all of that. And so uh, that was the salvation. That salvation took care of a lot of things. For example, uh, when you got saved, all your past is forgiven by God. How about that? I mean, the condemnation that was on you and on me, the guilt of sin, the condemnation of sin, the penalty of sin, all of that was wiped away the day that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. He said, Brother Baker, uh, how, how much sin did you commit before you got saved? Just 19 years of it. But the truth is, it doesn't matter. See, sometimes we, have, we, have, we, we look at sin as if how, uh, what people have done and uh, the wickedness in their life. But you got to understand that in the eyes of God, uh, it doesn't matter when a person gets saved. What matters is, is all are lost. And so when you got saved, you were found. You're no longer lost. You're found. God found you. You didn't find him. And so salvation, that's the first step. Uh, when you got saved, God birthed you into his family. He adopted you into his family. He gave you the Holy Spirit. He wrote your name down the Lamb's Book of Life. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Praise the Lord. He has given you his spirit, the Holy Spirit in you. He has made you a part of the church. He has made you a part of the bride of Christ. He has made you a part of the body of Christ. All those things happen when the day, the moment you got saved, whether you were nine years old or 90 years old, salvation, when it takes place, all those things come together. For example, when you got saved, you became a joint heir with Christ. Amen. Uh, when you got saved, God promised you a place in heaven. Amen. Because of Christ. Now, uh, after you get saved, and your, your past is gone, amen, as far as your sins. Do you know what? You will never, ever be condemned again. Never, never. Now, I didn't say you, you never, you, I didn't say you would, you would quit sinning. I just said you'll never be condemned again. See, after you got saved, you still have an old nature about you and in you. And that old nature will some, many times show up. And that's why Paul, Paul mentioned it uh, uh, when he said, you know, the things that I should not do, I'm doing those things. And the things that I'm not doing that I should do, I, I, I'm not doing those things there. And so the positive things I'm not doing, the negative things I find myself doing. And Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. And so just because you're saved does not make you sinless. But get this, this is good here. Hey, when, when you got saved... God no longer looks at you the way he used to see you. He no longer sees you as a lost, condemned sinner on your deserving to go to hell and go in there. He looks at you at, through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and you and I are as pure in his eyes as Jesus is. We're as holy as Jesus is. Now, we know that we're not holy. We know that we're not righteous because of this old body we live in, this old nature we have. But in God's eyes, we're pure and perfect. Amen. And now, that's no ticket to sin. That's no license to live like you want to. 
And because you are a child of God, he'll take care of that too. You might have to give you a spanking. So isn't it wonderful to be saved? To know that. And so, uh, and of course now, uh, salvation, uh, the process uh, that happens after you get saved, God wants to mold you and make it. He wants you to uh, yield yourself to him. Not necessarily surrender. I like the word yield. You know that? I like the word yield because when you yield to God, that means you're saying, Lord, I'm taking my hands off of me. I want you to put your hands on me. Lord, I want myself out of the way and I want you to, I want you to sit on the throne of my life. I don't want to run my life anymore. I do not want to control my life anymore. I want you to sit on the throne of my life and I want you to govern me any way you see fit. I want you to help me in my everyday living. And when you, when you yield to him every day, when you submit to the Holy Spirit every day, God can work on you. He can work through you. He can work out of you. I mean, you'll get to know him better. He'll get to know. He, he knows all about you anyway. But you'll get to know him better. Amen. Now, who's sitting on the throne of your life right now? Who, who has the most say-so in your life right now? You see, that's the part of salvation that's going on right now. He's working on us. Remember the song, he's still working on me, huh? Because I'm not what I should be. He wants to make me what I should be. Allow him to work on, allow him to put his hand in the glove of your life. Allow his hand to guide you and help you and strengthen you. And then our salvation will one day be complete. What is that, Brother Baker? It'll be complete when our life here is over. It'll be complete either when you, when you uh, leave here by the avenue of death or the avenue of the rapture. Amen. Aren't you glad of that? Brother Tommy and I were just talking back here before church and talking about getting sick and all this kind of stuff. And I said, Tommy, Jesus is coming uh, on August the 8th this year. He said, he will come forward in, preacher. <laughs> now, I was just cutting up with him. But the truth is, he's coming. Amen. Now, when he comes, when he comes... You and I are going to be caught up. We're going to be out of here, the song says. But if he doesn't come and, and uh, death becomes our, our transportation to heaven, our salvation will be made complete. We'll, we'll forever be with him. We'll forever be uh, in his place called heaven. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to one day, we call it the blessed hope. Amen, amen. So we have here, you have salvation's birth. That's the Christian's past. We see that here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, Paul's past. When I look at these verses here, it points to where he came from. Look in, look in verse 2. And well, let us, let's go back to verse one, where he says, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. In other words, I want to give you some safe things. This will be safe for you. Watch what he says. Beware of what? Dogs. Now, he's not talking about four-legged animals. Beware of dogs, be, beware of evil workers, beware of the uh, concession, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flourish. He's talking about his past. He points to where he came from. Beware of dogs. You see, Paul realized, you see, when somebody in the Bible days were considered filthy and trashy and all that, uh, uh, other words, you couldn't trust in them. You see, dogs weren't, pet, uh, weren't pets back in Bible days like they are today. Beware of dogs. Dogs were wild. Dogs would attack. Dogs would mutilate. He's referencing to people, don't be like a bunch of wild dogs. He said, notice what else he said. Beware of the uh, uh, concision. In other words, he wouldn't even use the word circumcision. He said he wouldn't even dignify it. You see, the, the Jewish law required that every Jewish man be circumcised. Beware of that crowd. He's looking at his past now. His past here, because of dogs. I, I, I put this beside that. Paul realized that uh, be careful of the dog pound. Those people that you uh, can't have any trust in. I thought about this, and, and, and he points to his reputation. 
and verse 5. Look at it. Look what he says. He said, uh, circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. He points to his reputation. Circumcise the eighth day, the stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. His reputation. Paul says, listen, if you think, if you go back up there, you think about it, he said, uh, uh, talk about confidence in the flesh. He said, you talk about the flesh and confidence. And he talked about his reputation. And everything he listed here were things that the average Jewish boy, young man lived to be. Boy, I'm not just any Jew. I was circumcised the eighth day. And that was very important. I won't go into that, but that was very important. Because if, you see, the thing is, that was put down on your birth record. And if you weren't circumcised in the right day, you'd still be a Jew, but you wouldn't be a top-notch Jew. Seventh, ninth, other day wouldn't matter. Had to be that day. We're talking about his reputation. You know what Paul is saying here? <laughs> Before I got saved, I had, I had some kind of reputation. He said, uh, uh, the stock of Israel, the stock of Israel, in other words, he was top stock. He wasn't just a run-of-the-mill Israelite. He said, the tribe of Benjamin. That was a the chosen tribe, that was the tribe that got, got the blessings laid upon him. A Hebrew of Hebrews. You heard the Hebrews? I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You heard today of folks were saying, boy, he's the best of the best. Paul is saying here about himself, his reputation. Looking back, he said, my reputation was like this. I was at the top of the class. If you were looking for somebody that you could say, he's got the goods, he said, they'd point to me. That's what he's saying here. So he talked about his reputation. Then he says here, not only does he point to his reputation, in verse 5 and 6, it points to his religion as touching the law of Pharisee. Now the Pharisees, boy, I'm telling you, and the Sadducees were the two governing, governing religious bodies of the Sanhedrin. And, uh, and so he was a part of that, a Pharisee. They believed in the resurrection and they believed in angels and all stuff of that matter. He said, touching the law of Pharisee. In other words, he's saying, I know the law. Talk about the law of God. As a Pharisee, I've studied the law of God. I've been, he was trained by one of the uh, most renowned men of his day and time, a man by the name of Gamaliel. He was trained by that man. And boy, to have him uh, as a teacher and a scholar was something else. Not everybody got that. So Paul said, I was trained by the best. I, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. Notice what else he said. He said, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. You talking about zeal? I had such zeal about me. I had such energy about me. I was such a Jew. I was such a Hebrew. I was such a Pharisee. You know what I did? I was able to get the papers and documents and these people called Christians and their followings. He said, I went after them. He said, I had such zeal. My whole purpose was to prove that I was, uh, was a man of, of the law, the law of God. And since these so-called Christians were not living according to the law, these Jewish saved people, he said, I went after them with a, with a mighty hard hand. I wanted to see every one of them either in prison or put to death. Woo! Now Paul is talking about his past. He said, I was at the top of my class. I was head above everybody. I was energetic. I saw what was going on there in Jerusalem. I hated it. I despised it. It went against my religion. It went against my rank. It went against my training. It went against my position. And I hated those Christians. Matter of fact, he said, I hated it so much that I, I stood by one day and held the coats 
of the people who stoned a man by the name of Stephen. And I applauded it. So it points to his religion. Touching this, he says, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. Touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. Now here was, here's what he was saying. He, he was bragging on himself. When it comes to the law, I was blameless. Now we know that he wasn't perfect. He thought he was. In his own eyes, this man, Saul of Tarsus was his name. He thought that he was, he was so righteous there was no law that he was breaking. He was perfect in God's eyes. He said blameless. He said, you check my record. You check my credentials and you'll find there's nothing about me that breaks God's law. Now we know that's not true. That's how he felt. That's how he saw himself. Now listen to me very carefully. There are people just like that today. Oh yeah. There are people today who have this idea that their reputation and their religion is so up here and they're so up there that they are really, really somebody. But in God's eyes, they're just like dogs. They're sinners. These are the things that he dreamed of. These are the, thing, the things that as a young boy growing up, he would see how, how the, the, the Pharisees lived. He, see, he saw how the, uh, the rich lived and he said, I want to be like them. I want to be somebody in my life. I want to have some things in my life. This, was, this, was, this is what my goal is. And all those things that he dreamed of and, uh, and tried to achieve, he did. I mean, here he is at the pinnacle of his life. I mean, all he's waiting on is to be voted into the Sanhedrin. That would like be the Supreme Court. And so these things are what he dreamed of. That's all he longed for. Today we live in a society just like the Apostle Paul or Saul of Tarsus. People who have a reputation, they have a religion tagged to them. And if you were to ask them to say some things, they might do a lot of bragging about themselves. And then we find here in verses 7 through 11, we find that he points to his faith in Christ. Well, the words, well, let's just let's, let's look at some things here, okay? It says here, uh, verse 7, but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ. Notice that phrase, but what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Not only uh, is Paul saying, I, I, I lost it all. In other words, all these things I gave up. In other words, he said, I lost them. In other words, he gave them up. That he might have the excellency of Christ. That he might know Christ in a more excellent way. That he might be pleasing in his eyes. The very one that he despised and, and hated and the very people he despised and hated. Now he loves with a passion. Isn't that wonderful? It points to his faith in Christ. Paul is not bragging about what he gave up but what he gained in Christ. He's not saying here, all this stuff, all this stuff. He's not bragging about that. What he's saying is this here, all those things that I lived for and dreamed of, he said, he said uh, uh, com compared to Christ, they're nothing. Because when you got saved, what did you offer Christ when you got saved? What did you have in your life that you could offer him that would satisfy him? Absolutely nothing. The day you got saved and the day I got saved was the day we, we came to him just as we were. 
sinners lost and needing a Savior. Lord, I can't offer you anything, but all I know is I want you to save me. I come to you asking you to forgive me of my sins and whatever you pray, but it wasn't the prayer that saved you. It was a belief in your heart that saved you. Amen? You can't buy salvation. You can't buy Christ. He can't be purchased. So what Paul is saying here, these things that I gave up, oh my, they don't compare to what I got. Why? Because the things here don't compare to the things there. Think about this now. I, got, I was in my study this afternoon just looking at my, my message. And you know, Paul didn't have a New Testament in his hand. Paul was not able to carry with him all the Old Testament scriptures. But being a Pharisee and being the man that he was, he knew the Old Testament. Now, he may have had some scriptures. So we got to understand, he didn't have a church home per se. He had churches that God used him to establish, and he, he wanted to, to be a blessing to them. But he didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As a matter of fact, the book of Galatians and the book of Ephesians tells us that he had a revelation of Jesus Christ. He never saw Jesus like Peter, Peter Paul, and John, and James, and all them. But Jesus revealed to him. Jesus came to Paul, and Paul got to meet Jesus. So all this came by revelation from Jesus Christ. And boy, just that revelation, you know what happened to Paul? He said, just to know him. I want to know him. I don't want to know about him. I want to know him. And that's the difference in being saved and not saved. See, a lot of religious people know about Jesus. They can tell you about Jesus. We, were, we went to Israel years ago. Mrs. Breaker and I went to Israel many years ago. The church sent us out for our 25th wedding anniversary. And our tour guide, this man could quote Scripture, Old and New Testament. I mean, you'd have thought he was a preacher. I mean, he was something. He said, now, you know, over in the book of such and so, in the Old Testament, and over here in the New Testament, you'll find it. And he was quoting Scripture as we toured. Well, on the, on the Saturday we were over there, their Sabbath, the tour guide was not with us, but another guy was there. Actually, the owner of the tour guide company was with us. He said, the reason that our guide is not here today, it's their Sabbath. He said, how many of you thought he was saved? Raise your hand. We all raised our hand. He talked like a saved man. Quoting scripture, talking about Jesus. He said, no, he's not saved. And Paul knew about Christ before he got saved. He'd heard about this man named Jesus. Oh, yeah. But that day when he saw Stephen die and how he died, I believe it was then that God began to speak to Paul or Saul of Tarsus and help lead to his salvation. And so Paul knew about Christ, but now he knows him. He said, I want to know him better. I don't want to know just, I want to know him. Huh? You want to know Miss Baker? And I come move in our house, stay with us day at day, every day the rest of your life, seven days a week, and you'll get to know us. You'll find out some things. Your eyes will be opened. <laughs> Why? You'll get to know us. And so Paul is saying, I want to know him in an intimate way. I want, I want, to, be, I want to be consumed by him. Now here's my point. Should we not all want to be like that? Should not our desire to be that there's nothing in my life more important than him? There's nothing in my dreams or ambition more important than him. Yes, you need to have goals and you need to have dreams and you need to have a, a vision for your life. But make sure of this, don't let things get you sidetracked. Love him, honor him. And so it points to his faith in Christ. And uh, you can be religious enough to get into the, <laughs> into the church yet not righteous enough to get into heaven. Paul was religious enough to get into the, into the synagogue, but Paul realized he was not righteous enough to get into heaven. You see, he was trusting his own righteousness. He was trusting what he knew and what he was doing and how he was living. 
But boy, when, he, when the Lord Jesus Christ met him on that Damascus road, he realized that his righteousness was not going to fit the bill. His righteousness looked good in the eyes of man. His righteousness looked good in his own eyes. Oh, but when Christ showed up, it's a big difference. Oh, boy. And Paul longed to know Christ. His past, listen, his past would have put him in good standing with men. His past. And that was his, uh, he'd been a prestigious man. Well, the words had, had, his past put him in a position of, of prestige with people. Is that not what a lot of people want today, prestige? To be applauded by men, to see their name in the headlines, to, to be this, and, and in other words, to have a, their, their name to be well known. And some people live for that. Paul's past would have gotten him that prestige. His past would have made him a prosperous man. Well, in other words, had Paul continued the way that he was going with his past, he could have been a wealthy man. He could have had servants. He could live in, a, in one of the best houses in that land. I mean, he'd have had money. He'd have been a prestigious, prosperous man if he'd have stayed with his past. But he said, all of that, all of that is but dung to me. And that word dung means human waste. It stinks. Oh, he, his past would have made him a powerful man religiously. His past would have made him a powerful man religiously. You see, Paul, his dream was, I want to be a doctor of the law. I just don't want to be just a Pharisee. He said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. There's Pharisees that are, but buddy, I'm above the regular normal Pharisee. My goal is this. I want to be called Dr. Paul. I want to be, I want to be in the Sanhedrin. You know what that is. That is the, the highest group of religious people of that day and time. You had to really be somebody and know some things to be that. A powerful man. Had Paul stayed with his past, he could have been prestigious. He could have been wealthy and powerful. In the eyes of man and in his own eyes, had he stayed with his past. Mm. His past would have given him a sense of security. His past would have given him a sense of security. He could have said, you know, I, 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 there's nothing in my life that's wrong. I know that how I'm living pleases God. God looks at me, you know what he sees? He sees a man that's obedient to the law. Me and God and I are on good terms. His past would have given him, a, given him a sense of security, but it was a false sense of security. And that same thought, that same crowd is alive today. They have a sense of security because of, of what they believe religiously and morally. I am not that bad. I'm not what I ought to be. I know that. But I'm uh, me and the old man upstairs on good terms. I got news for it. God's not the old man upstairs. And so his past would have made him a powerful man. He'd have made him a man. Uh, uh, Paul had a false kids security. And John R. Rice preached a sermon one time entitled "Religious but Lost," and he used Nicodemus as the as the object of his message, religious but lost. Paul was a religious man, but lost. He was a righteous man, but not the righteousness of Christ. Had his own righteousness. And so we understand. It was, listen, it was a joy. It was a joy to Paul to give all these things up. It wasn't like he said, oh, woe is me. I got to give all this up. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. No, 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 no. 
It was a joy, Paul said. It, we go back and read it. It was a joy. I count it all joy. Why? Because I'm reaping the benefits of my decision to follow Christ. I'm a blessed man, even though I'm a... He's writing from a Roman prison cell. You th it sounds like he's writing from a hotel room. But he's writing, realizing he may die where he's at. He's thinking, I may get out of here, but I may not. He found it a joy when he compared. And he didn't even have a New Testament. He didn't have the book of Revelation. He didn't have the four Gospels. He had some Old Testament scriptures, but he had the Lord Jesus in his heart. Jesus had appeared to him and revealed to him some things. And that's what he had. That's what he went on. You and I have a, listen, we have a revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen now, we have a revelation of Christ that Paul did not have. We have a complete Bible. We know how it's going to turn out, don't we? Don't we know that? We don't know when Christ is going to come back, but we know he's coming back. And we're not in the dark to that. We are children of light. Paul didn't have a preacher to come along and encourage him, but he had Christ. He said, he said, just to know, just to the fellowship of his suffering, huh? He counted that joy. It was a joy for Paul when he suffered for the cause of Christ. Could you and I be like that? I don't know. But there's been others down through the centuries who found it a joy to suffer for Christ. Why? Because Christ was real to them. How real is he to you? God will, listen, Christ will never, ever twist anybody's arm to be saved, nor will he ever twist any saved person's arm to get them to live like he should. He won't do it that way. He's not that kind of savior nor master. You'll either do it because you love him or you don't love him. That's what, that's what it is. That's why, that's why he said, I'm compelled by his love. I'm pushed on, I'm carried on because I know how much he loved me. Why, well, Jesus gave up everything that I could be saved. What a, what, why should I complain about giving up my doctorate? Why should I complain about laying down uh, all what could have been mine? He said, blessed be to God, I'm, I'm in good hands with Christ. And so it was a joy. They became nothing to him. We all have a past, amen? Sin was passed down to us from, from our father and our mother, Adam and Eve. It's passed down, amen? And with the passing of sin down to us came the consequences of sin. Death and hell. Separation from God, spiritually, and eternal death and hell unless, some, unless God did something. And so, because of Christ, our past is gone. And salvation is passed to us. <laughs> Christ, he came, he lived without blemish. He lived without spot, without sin. Died a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. The Lamb of God poured out his blood that our sin debt could be paid. And all who believe upon him have their sins washed away and they're a pass from life unto death. Amen. Aren't you glad of that? And, they, and so all things are new now in Christ. Salvation is passed to us and because it has been passed to us, we have a, we have a brand new present. Uh, our past is gone. We have a brand new future. How about that? All because of Christ. And so Paul writing here, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, rejoice. He said, he said uh, uh, in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You see, the Jewish people believed in a general resurrection. But that general resurrection was not, did not include Christ. But, but the resurrection made things different. When Christ rose from the grave, 
Paul realized it's not going to be just a general resurrection. It's going to be a resurrection, a first resurrection and a second resurrection. Huh? And Christ is that first resurrection. The second resurrection is for all the lost. We're a part of the first resurrection. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. So all things are new in him. In, in the Lord Jesus Christ, God sees me as his child. God sees me clear and pure and holy. And because he sees that, I should strive each day that I live to yield myself to the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in me. I do my best to please him every day of my life, though I don't. What about you tonight? Looking at your past, where do you think you would be today if you weren't saved? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about your life if you were not saved? Huh? Somebody said, Brother Baker, if you could change anything in your life, would you? Well, humanly, I, would, I said this. Yes, I, I wish that I could have gotten saved sooner. Earlier in my life, that I could have maybe given my teenage years to Christ and those years there in, in school. But you can't choose that, can you? I feel, I feel that had I not gotten saved, there's no telling what my life would be like. I know I would not be happily married. I know that I would not have near what I have now. Well, well, I had such a vicious temper. I had such a mean spirit in me. Once I, once I lost it, I'd either be dead and in hell or in prison, most likely. But Christ saved me. Changed my life inside and out. You must have been pretty bad, Brother Baker. Well, well just like you were, just lost. Just lost. And the Savior found me. He came to where I was, Amen. There in that little old, little old small white church out close to Highway 200 going between Winsboro and Great Falls, the Mount Zion Baptist Church. woo In a revival meeting, I got saved. How about that? And I didn't know then what I know now. Boy, I tell you, what, over the years, uh, uh, what Christ has done for me and with me, ah, oh, he just blessed my heart beyond measure. And we are blessed beyond measure. Amen? Look at tonight. Now, your life, the salvation you have in Christ, he cannot, he cannot make you be a good Christian. He cannot make you be obedient. He cannot make you do anything for him. He wants you to do that on your own. And that's why Paul said, he said, I don't have a life for myself. He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is the gain. Amen. So tonight, my question is this. Your past is past. Thank God it's past, but what about your future? We'll, we'll pick up the, the, the story, the second phase of salvation on Wednesday night as we talk about sal the joy of salvation in the present. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Holy Spirit, thank you for helping me preach tonight once again. What a joy to know that my sins are gone, 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 that I'm forgiven tonight that I'm a, I'm a part of the family of God and the bride of Christ, thankful that I have a place waiting on me when my life here is over, to know that when Jesus comes back in the rapture, I'll be taken away. Or if I am well, here when I, and death takes me away, dear God, I'm so thankful Christ has taken the sting out of death. And Lord, we want to live as long as we can, but Lord, help us to live to glorify and honor you. And when our time comes to go, whether it be through the rapture or the resurrection, Lord, we want to be pleasing in thy sight. Bless now this invitation, dear God. Help each other, dear Lord, just for a few moments to reminisce and look back to what you've done for us already and how you've blessed us. And yet, Lord, the best is yet to come. Thank you for that promise. We ask you now to bless the service in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet. Christian you're a child of God you're not a beggar you're not a pauper you're blessed
if you've got a, a wife or a husband that is saved, you want to praise God for that. Amen. If your kids are saved, your mom and daddy is saved, but make sure you're saved. A lot of folks are trusting in our good works, and yet some folks think their past has been so wicked that there's no way God could save them. But I'm glad that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. That the vilest of sinners can be saved if they'll come to Christ and call upon Him. He'll save them. He'll forgive them. They'll be just as saved as you and I. Aren't you glad of that? I am. Paul was a religious man. Great reputation, great name. But you notice when he got saved, his name changed to? From Saul to Paul. Amen. All right. Well, it's been good to be in the house of God once again. Hey, aren't you glad of that? Hope you have a great week. Don't forget church again on this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. In the meantime, as you go out and get out there, just uh, uh, be careful. <laughs> uh, the, the virus is out there somewhere. And you may, already, you, are, you may have it right now. I don't even know it. I hope not. Huh? My wife said I already had it. She said when I was sick back in what, February, January, she said you had, you had the COVID, buddy. I said, I did not. She said, yes, she did. Don't argue with me. I'm the nurse. <laughs> All right. I said, well, if I've had it, thank God it's over with. Hopefully. Okay. All right. God bless you. You're dismissed. Be careful.